So you're in the Hinsey Hall. There's a beautiful cabinet of curiosities of entomological specimens, full of insects, beetles, butterflies and other bugs, all aesthetically pleasing, showing their structures, shape and form. I'd like you to think about who collected these specimens, what areas they were collected in, and who they were collected by. Who's missing from this story? Who doesn't have a voice? Where are the silences? Some of those silences will be within the Indigenous peoples collecting. And one of those stories is about a man from Yorkshire called Henry Smeathman. He, in the 1770s, was funded by the naturalists of that time to actually go and collect insects from Sierra Leone in West Africa. And he became known as the father of termitology. Smeathman was using indigenous and enslaved labour in Sierra Leone to collect insects. They were often investigating the termite mounds to find the queen or the winged reproductive of the soldier termites. Often we lose the record of who collected these specimens, in particular, those indigenous people. And this is perhaps because at the time, the European naturalists who were exploring the world and so-called collecting were more famous and more recognised. Around this time, these naturalists were using slave ships and trading ships to transfer their specimens back to Europe. Here, they would then identify those specimens to species and label them, often giving them species names that were accredited to their fellow naturalists, their other contemporaries, or named after the environment where they were found. But what often didn't happen was the recognition of the labour and the people who had originally helped to collect the specimens. And what isn't documented most of the time is the environment that they were actually collected in, where there was a lot of enslavement and poor practice in terms of the use of labour. There were also very few examples of species being named after Indigenous peoples. For example, today there are still collections named after famous naturalists such as Smeathman and Darwin. However, they weren't necessarily collected specifically by those individuals. So what we need to think about today is changing that, acknowledging it and questioning more about who collected when, why, where and what. And in terms of that, we need to change or be a little bit more accessible in terms of the language that we use. So within the scientific community, we use Latinized species names, but that's not entirely accessible unless you work within that sector. What we should be thinking about is how we apply indigenous language how we use common names, how we filter that information that we already have within museum spaces, within the documents that we hold, within the museum's archives, and within the external and the public interpretation for our public visitors. With opening up in terms of the language and the interpretation that we use within both our public and research spaces, we can encourage more people to want to learn and engage with the work that the museum is doing and also for people to actually care about nature and the environments that surround them. So this is not about rewriting history. This is about enhancing history and bringing together all of the information. We do this all the time within the scientific community. It's about acknowledging those who have not historically been acknowledged before putting all of that information together and creating a more rounded and holistic picture. In terms of museum, specimen, interpretation, culture and heritage. So next time you visit a museum, I'd like you to think about whose contribution might be missing. Next, we're going to see Darwin and talk about the man who taught him taxidermy.